morning and welcome to worship in the chapel at First United Methodist Church of Portland, Oregon. It's great to be with you in uh, bringing back a new service, uh, one that we were doing in person prior to the pandemic shutdown. And now we're bringing it back so that we have another style of worship that we can share with you. Joining me in worship here in the chapel today is Mary Segarra, our lay leader, the Reverend Ethan Gregory, one of the pastors on staff, and uh, Shelley Edwards on piano, Genevieve Meister uh, as our soloist, and then our tech team, Lindsay McGill, and our overall director, the fabulous Jean Balcom, without whom none of this would be possible. And we are very grateful that you are here worshiping with us as well. Today we celebrate as Rally Day in the life of this church. It is a day for us to reconnect and recommit to this community of faith, even at a distance. Unfortunately, we had to postpone our Saturday part of Rally Weekend due to the wildfires across Oregon and the smoke here in Portland. If we get the rain that is forecasted this week and the air clears, we will have our party pickup next Saturday in our parking lot. Watch your Thursday email for details. The pastor's Bible study on Zoom began this Wednesday. We had 19 folks participating in a very fun and lively discussion. We will do this every Wednesday from 6 to 7 in the evening, and you are welcome to join us any week. It is a standalone event, so you don't need to be there every single Wednesday. The Zoom link for that will be found in the Thursday email as well, or you can let Ethan know if you would like him to send it to you directly in your inbox. Uh, our initial small prayer group begins meeting this Wednesday from 9 to 10 in the morning. If you've registered, you'll be sent a Zoom link to participate. If you would still like to come and join a small prayer group, just let me know and I'll be sure you get the information. And now as Mary lights the Christ candle for us, I invite you to light a candle in your home or wherever you are worshiping today. Candles are symbolic for us of the light of Christ and the presence of God in our midst. We know that God is always present with us, but we need the reminder. And as we enter into a time of worship, candlelight helps to focus us, helps to remind us to pay attention to God's love and God's presence this day. Now I would invite you to share the peace of Christ with whomever you are worshiping with or even with yourself. May the peace of Christ be with us. May the peace of Christ be with our families, with our friends, even with our enemies. Let us worship.
Please join me in the call to worship. A love that never ceases. A creativity that designed the universe. A hope that cannot be quenched. A pursuit, a pursuit of reconciliation, reconciliation no matter the cost. These are the basics of the God we come to worship. A, a calling to do no harm. harm. A commitment to doing good. And an intention to stay in love with God. These are the basics of faith we profess and the ways we live it out. Right, right now, right, right where you are, this is a moment to come back to the basics. This is a moment to heed again three simple rules. Do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. Right, right now, now, right where you are, come, come back, back to, to the, the basics. basics. As we worship and as we live, so be it. Amen. And now, friends, let us enter into prayer together. God of faithful followers of Jesus throughout the ages, from the Acts of the Apostles to the Acts of Wesley, Whitfield, and Asbury, you have never stopped calling us to love. You summed it up in two commandments, love God and love your neighbor. And as Methodists, we sum it up in three rules, do no harm, do good, and stay in love with you. But regardless of how we express it or how we describe the details and the how-tos, it remains clear that we never do this work alone. And so through our worship this day, remind us that we go together. Wherever you lead us, we do not walk the journey alone. May our singing, praying, and entering into your story and our story Unite us together as we go about the great work of love. In the name of the Christ whom we follow, we pray. Amen. I'd like to give you just a few words of introduction to the scripture which Mary will read for us this morning. First, from the book of Acts in the second chapter, our part of that chapter tells the story of the beginnings of the Christian community. It follows right after the story of Pentecost and the gift of the Holy Spirit, which inspires people to come together to share with one another, and to seemingly live together in love. And then the second reading that Mary will read for us is from the 14th chapter of the book of Romans, where we find a more realistic, or at least a more human, picture of Christian community. 
Paul writes to the early church in Rome where apparently disputes have arisen over how they are to live out their faith. Do they have to conform to Jewish law or are they free from it? Paul himself was embroiled with similar arguments with other leaders of the burgeoning Jesus movement. For instance, James and Peter, they do not approve of Paul's ministry with the Gentiles. They thought a few Gentile converts would be okay, but James and Peter believed Jesus was meant to be a Messiah primarily for the Jews. Therefore, converts, in their opinion, had to submit to Jewish law. When Paul writes to the Romans, he is not only addressing their community conflict, he is also pleading with the leaders of the church in Jerusalem to stop interfering with his ministry. You see, Paul's vision for the church opened Christianity up to a broader audience, and yet it also created conditions that were ripe for disagreement, dissension, and conflict. The inevitable result of human beings trying to live together. In this ethical treatise, Paul calls us back to basics. Let's listen as Mary reads the scriptures for us. Our first scripture reading is Acts 2, 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Our second scripture reading this morning is Romans 14, 1 through 12. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain. And those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day observe it in honor of the Lord. Also, those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain Abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or your sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. The word of God for the people to, of God. Thanks be to God. Grace and peace to you from God and from Jesus Christ who calls us into community. Well, it's been quite a week, hasn't it? Between the marathon of pandemic 
with its need for distance and for caution and for care, and the ongoing civil unrest with its need for questioning and reflecting and deep, deep listening, now we have wildfires, the smoke in our eyes and in our lungs and the need for emergency evacuations displacing thousands of Oregonians, if only temporarily. When the power went out at my house Wednesday night and I looked outside at the orange glow illuminating the night, it was easy to think apocalyptic, end of the world kind of thoughts. I found myself thinking, oh my God, what now? What next? It's been quite a week. And here we are now going back to basics when it comes to our faith. Maybe our timing could not have been better. It's easy to get lost within all the crisis and trauma we are experiencing in any given moment. It's easy to get lost in that and to lose sight of what is foundational to our lives, fundamental for our faith. And while it may feel as if the pressure is particularly high right now, that we are living in a huge moment requiring life and death answers to the question of what it means to be a Christian. The truth is, this moment may not be all that unique after all. The late great preacher Fred Craddock once put it this way. He asked, have you ever listened to a sermon where all the illustrations were Albert Schweitzer, Mother Teresa, and the missionaries whose feet froze off in the frozen tundra. He says, I remember sitting in church as a child, and I used to say to myself, you know, it's a shame you can't be a Christian in this little town. Nobody here is chasing or imprisoning or killing Christians. As a teenager at summer camp, standing around a lake holding a candle, Next to other teenagers, all singing together, Are Ye Able? Fred found himself very moved, and he began to tell God, Yes, God, I am able to give my life to you. Now this led to Fred imagining himself running in front of a train to save a child, or dashing into a high surf to save someone who was drowning. He said, I pictured myself against a gray wall, and some soldier would say, one last chance to deny Christ and live, whereupon I would confess my faith, and they would say, ready, aim, fire. As my body slumped, the flag was at half-mast, and widows were weeping in the afternoon. Fred went on, Later, a monument would be built, and people would come with their cameras. Johnny, you stand over there where Fred gave his life. Let's get a picture. Fred says, you know, I was very sincere then in my imagining, as I have been sincere ever since. I do give my life to God. But nobody warned me that I could not write one big check. I've had to write 45 years of little checks. 87 cents, 21 cents, a dollar three cents. Just nibbled away at giving this life to God. Friends, most of us, thankfully, will never be asked to write that one big check. But all of us are called to nibble away at giving our lives for the sake of the gospel. In a thousand little ways, through the everyday ordinary choices we make, when we choose to follow what John Wesley put forth as fundamental 
for the people called Methodist, what some have called three simple rules. Do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. When the earliest Christ followers gathered together and welcomed those who joined them and shared whatever they had in common, they were trying to do no harm. They sought to do good. They knew they had to stay connected, to practice regular worship and prayer and spiritual reflection if they were going to stay in love with God. But you know, it did not take long before things began to fall apart. As early as 57 years following Christ's resurrection, Paul is writing to the Christians in Rome, spurred on by deep divisions plaguing that community. This was a diverse gathering of folk with some Jewish members and some Gentiles. And they were arguing over which laws of the first covenant were essential for Christians to follow and which religious activities of the Roman Empire it was essential for Christians to avoid. They couldn't agree whether or not a Christian could marry a non-believer. They could not agree whether a Christian man had to be circumcised or not. They argued about whether a Christian woman could speak in church. Ha! Guess who won that argument? They also argued about whether a Christian could eat meat that had been offered to idols, or for that matter, could eat meat at all. And for both sides of these disputes, there were genuine spiritual, theological, and traditional components to their argument. Jewish Christians believed they, these were questions of fidelity to scripture. And Gentile Christians, they pointed to salvation by grace and the freedom that Christ offers. This was not a matter of personal taste or political preference. These were serious spiritual issues that could be seen in biblical and theological terms. In his letter, Paul does not deny any of that, but instead he calls those Christians and he calls you and me back to basics by lifting up a far greater spiritual reality, the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Paul suggests we do not all need to march in lockstep on issues that are not central to the faith. And we must not criticize every little thing about each other either. In the end, Paul tells both parties to leave each other in peace, to stop judging or marginalizing the other, to stop grading other people's spirituality. Knock it off, Paul says and go back to the basics. In life and in death, we belong to Jesus, for whom love is the ultimate, foundational, fundamental basic of faith. For Jesus, going back to basics is always going back to love one another as I have loved you and love others as yourself. Clarence Jordan, a Southern farmer and New Testament Greek scholar who founded Koinonia Farm, out of which grew Habitat for Humanity. Old Clarence was fond of saying this, We will worship the hind legs off Jesus, then not lift a finger to do a single thing he says. Perhaps that is because we find it so very difficult to do the one thing Jesus consistently says, love one another. Go back to the basics. The basic is always going to be love. 
the founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley, was confronted in 1774 with a community struggling with their differences. He later wrote in his journal, I met those of our society who had votes in the ensuing election, and I advised them, first, to vote without fee or reward for the person they judged most worthy. I then advised them to speak no evil of the person they voted against. And finally, I advised them to take care their spirits were not sharpened against those that voted on the other side. Imagine what might happen if we were to go back to those basics in this current election cycle. Imagine how our experience of one another in this church might change if we followed Wesley's advice, if we paid attention to Paul's vision of Christianity when it comes to questions surrounding things like Black Lives Matter and the call for racial equity. What might happen if we took this advice when we are discussing climate change and the imperative to reduce our carbon footprint, or economic systems that reward some while marginalizing others? What might happen if we remembered this advice when engaged in a heated debate about access to health care or compassion for immigrants? Or even the most basic question of who we will choose as our president. We need to be reminded that going back to basics means going back to love not a love that judges worth, but a love that bestows worth. A love that bestows worth on those with whom we totally agree and on those with whom we vehemently disagree. A love that bestows worth on those who think like us, act like us, look like us, vote like us, and on those who could not be more unlike us. When I was a little girl, I loved to ride my bike. I loved the feeling of freedom as I tore down the street in front of my house and as I ventured beyond that street all around the town. I soon realized that not all streets were completely smooth. Some had cracks in the asphalt and bumps that could throw you off balance on your bicycle. So you had to pay attention. You had to watch. You had to be alert. As I began to pay attention to those cracks, I began to notice that right in the midst of them grew the most wondrous array of life. Tiny plants with little purple flowers dandelions stretching yellow smiling faces to the sun, volunteer maple trees and Douglas fir seedlings. All manner of life seemed to withstand the pressure of bicycles and feet and even cars traveling right on top of them. It occurs to me this morning we would all do well to pay attention to similar cracks in our lives. Those people and those places and those situations which perplex us and discomfort us. Those times, like now, that interrupt the smooth progression of our ordinary day-to-day -day lives. We need to pay attention because more often than not, that is where Jesus is going to meet us, right in the midst of our own brokenness, right in the middle of our own cracked lives. Jesus will meet us where our hearts are the hardest, 
Jesus will meet us where our wounds are the deepest and where our fears are the greatest. Right there, Jesus is going to meet us and open his arms wide and welcome us in and whisper, it's time to go back to basics. And the basics are always found in love. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now, friends, we enter into the time in our worship in which we respond to the God whom we have met in worship this day through the giving of our gifts, tithes, and offerings. You can give online at our website, fumcpdx.org, and click on the Give tab, or you can send your checks in by mail. And now let us prepare for these moments as we enter into prayer together. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us indeed. Open up our hearts and our minds and reorient our thoughts, feelings, and actions towards generosity. That basic practice of our faith that reminds us that the way of following Jesus is the way of abundance. And so we cannot help but share. Spirit of the living God, bless these our gifts, tithes, and offerings this day. And help us to keep giving of ourselves to the work of love and justice in the world. In the name of the Christ we pray. Amen.
We come now to the time of response in our chapel service. If you were here in person, you would see that we have several stations set up around the building, around the, the chapel, and uh, we're going to invite you to participate in this by traveling with us from station to station, beginning with the Wisdom Wall. We come now to the contemplation corner where we find these words from Parker Palmer on solitude and community. Solitude does not necessarily mean living apart from others. It means never living apart from oneself. Community does not necessarily mean living face to face with others. It means never forgetting that we are connected. Now we move to the prayer station where you are invited to spend some time reflecting upon the people, the places, the situation that is closest to your own heart today as Ethan lights a few candles for us. Our final station brings us to the Creative Arts Center, 
Some of you may have downloaded this little graphic of a tree with spaces to fill in your spiritual family that came to you in the Thursday email. If you click on the link for the chapel service, you'll find it there. Or you could just spend some time in reflecting. Who is it that you would name? Who fills out the branches of your spiritual family tree? Your mentors, your role models, your brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, friends, let us go forth from this worship into our day, remembering to go back to basics, the basic that brings us to love. And may the peace of Christ go with us all. Amen.